Hello, my name is Tian Wang from Team Pangu. My friend, my friend Xu Hao cannot be here. What a pity! And in this in this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Mac OS security, and I'm going to share some kernel vulnerabilities that can be directly exploited inside the Safari sandbox environment. And this is the agenda of my talk. And I think from the last talk, we all we all already observed that the, any audio or video drivers inside the kernel might be very, very massive, and a lot of bugs there. I think a similar thing happens to iOS or macOS. So it, I will start by a very short introduction, and then we will review the attack surface in Safari. I mean, how in the Safari sandbox, how can we attack the kernel? And then we will share some very good and interesting kernel vulnerabilities. And I'm, I'm going to also share some exploitation details. And finally, I'm going to conclude the talk. So about me, I'm a co-founder of Team Pangu. And our team is known for releasing jailbreak tools for iOS 7, 8, and 9. And we regularly present our work and the different security conference. I think after. After ShakaCon, I will be very proud to add ShakaCon to the list. And so macOS Sierra, which is the 13th major release of macOS. I think many people in this room are using macOS. And this version was released to end users on September 20th last year. Because it's very popular, it became a very hot target in different Pong contexts, like Pong to Own or Pong Fest. And so a, tip, a typical Pong process is, looks like this. So basically, you create a malicious web page, and you use, mobile f uh, you use Safari to access the web page. And if you can pop up a calculator or a terminal running without the sandbox, basically you win the game. And you can get extra bonus if the calculator or the terminal run as root. So it sounds easy, but a lot of stuff to do. So first, you need a re remote code execution in Safari. And Safari process model is based on WebKit 2. That means Safari, the whole Safari is split into different families, different processes. For example, there is a process called web, uh, web content. And anyway, so for the process model, you guys can refer to the, the two links on the, on the page. And they have more details about the uh, process model. And the web process is responsible for loading, parsing, and rendering the web page. So that means it's more vulnerable because you have a lot of work to do. Right? So the more functionalities you have, the more likely you have bugs. So web process is the main target to, to find the remote code execution bugs. But Apple also knew that. So web process is heavily confer, uh, confined by the sandbox. So sandbox will limit the, what the web process can access to the whole system. What the influence it can produce to the whole system. So to win the Pong fest, so basically you need to uh, you need to do extra step. You need to escape the sandbox. So basically you have two ways. One way is you can attack other system services that can be directly communicated by the web process, like phone D and the Windows Server. Interestingly, I think this year, during Power to Own context, many teams finally won the Safari category. So they get the root permission through Safari. But most of them select Windows Server as the, as the sandbox escape target. And the other way is you can directly exploit kernel vulnerabilities. So this is the focus of our talk. So how can we directly exploit kernel vulnerabilities inside the web process sandbox? So 
In order to find the bugs, we need to know where we, to where we, we can find them. Basically, if you check the two uh, sandbox profiles, the location is pretty long, you can get the, 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 the path here. Inside the two pro uh, sandbox profiles, they define what kind of resource or influence the web process can produce to the system. And there are, there are a lot of rules, like what kind of files you can read, create, write, and what kind of system properties you can modify or, or get. And among such rules, the most interesting part for us is IOKit open. So basically, allow IOKit open indicate what kind of macOS drivers you can directly communicate. So don't, don't expect there are many drivers you can directly talk with inside the web process. Basically, if I remember correctly, it's less than 10. So what does IOKit mean? So if you are familiar with L, uh, I mean macOS kernel programming, you must be very familiar with IOKit. IOKit is a collection of system frameworks and tools and other resources for creating device drivers. Basically, yes, you can, you can think IOKit is for macOS drivers. And the user land framework called IOKit.framework is a dynamic library. It provides extensive user mode APIs to support the, the, the communication from or between the user land and the kernel, such as memory sharing and uh, notification messaging and other more complicated method calls. So a typical cycle, uh, a typical cycle of using a allocate is like this. So you define a matching dictionary. In the dictionary, you, you, want, you, you can specify what kind of driver you want to talk. And you invoke an API called IO service get matching service, which will look up a registered IO service object in the kernel and return a handler to the user, user land, it's a port. And after getting that port, you can use IO service open, which will create a connection to the IO service object. And the return port represents a user client object. After you get the user client object, there are tons of APIs you can use to continue to communicate with the IO user client. I list uh, two of them. One is IO connect set notification port. We will see this API later. Basically, it's used to set a port to receive notifications from the user client. And uh, another API is IO connect call method. It's used to pass or get data from the the user client object. So basically, the, you can see that you have so many ways to exchange data or instruct the kernel. All these interface, they are a text service. So what we do is we knew what, what, what drawers we can, we can open. So we just manually analyze them one by one and, and each method one by one. So luckily, we find some of bugs. So let's go ahead with the bugs and the exploitations. So in short, I'm going to share three interesting bugs. One is a uninitialized heap issue in IO audio family, which can lead to an info leak problem. And it can be used to bypass the kernel address layout randomization. And the second one is in the AMD graphics driver. It's a in uninitialized stack variable. It can result in an arbitrary code execution. And the third one is, uh, is one of my favorite. It's a hyperflow. So basically, it's not a typical programming error. It's a fundamental error in the data sharing mechanism in IOKit. I'm going to sh show you more details later. OK, let's go to the first one the info leak in IO audio family. Actually, the, because this drawer or this module is open source, you can get the source code from op opensource.apple.com. It's much easier to review the code if you, I mean, you have, having source code is 
much easier if you only have binary. And so basically, this drawer is used to ma to to organize and manage the the audio drawers, audio devices, hardware. So this user client allow user space program to register a notification port, and later the this user client will send some notification message to the user land programs. Like, so if you if your program is sensitive to, for, for example, if your program has some functionalities about the, the audio volume, so if the user changes the audio volume, you, your application is supposed to receive the notification. So this is for that purpose. And the user land API IO connect set notification port will reach the so if you create a IO audio user client, audio control user client, you pass it to IO connect set notification. Finally, in the kernel you will reach the code called uh, reject notification port. The source code looks like this. So in this function and it will allocate a structure called the notification message. And the allocation is IOMalloc IO aligned. And the, the left corner defines the, the structure information. So basically, at the beginning, there is a message header. In the following, you can see a type. It's an integer 32. And a dash ref is integer 32. And also, a watch star sender. If you look at the initialized code, basically it initializes these members one by one. But inside this function, you will see that actually it doesn't initialize sender field and also the type field. So the code forget to totally zero out the, the malloc buffer. So. Later, if some notification happens, I mean, like the volume is changed, the, the kernel object, our audio control user client, will send the notification to the user land. This is how the notification is sent. So basically, it will directly call the, the API, the kernel API mark message sent from kernel, and it will send the whole message to the user land including the initialized data. So the notification message is uh, located in the key alloc 72 zone. And the send field, the offset, is 38 in hex. So that means, basically, we can, we can leak 8 bytes and the offset of 68 in hex in an object in the zone 72. So the idea, I think the, the root cause is very clear. So it's exploiting the vulnerability seems to be very easy. So we just create the IO audio control user client objects many times, as, as many as, as we want. And for each user client, we can register a notification port. And uh, somehow, if we can trigger the notic notification event, we will receive the notification message. And inside the notification message, we will get a lot of uninitialized data. And, but to make the whole vulnerability meaningful, we have two challenges. So first, how can we trigger the notification event inside the web content process? And also, how can we make the leaked data meaningful? Like, for example, we want to bypass kernel address layout realization, the key slide value. So, Every time you, you, you boot your Mac OS, so the kernel will be loaded at different locations. There is a slide value. So if we can leak that value, we can totally bypass the randomization protection. So for the first challenge, if, if there, there's no sandbox, it's very easy. So we can directly call API IO registry entry set CF properties. We can directly set the property named IO audio control value, which indicates the volume. So we can directly call this function, and then it will trigger the notification. Unfortunately, the sandbox profile for web content process is, it doesn't allow to set this property. 
So basically, we cannot di directly set this property. So for a long time, we believed that the bug may not be exploitable inside the sandbox. But finally, we realized that actually you can somehow instruct the system service to change the volume. So what we did is this. So I find if I change the volume using the, the, the keyboard, I can, my program can receive the notification. So I reverse engineered the process. Who is used to set the volume? And finally, I find a system service called Call Audio D. And you, you, you can, if you, if you go to Patrick's talk this morning, so he also talked about this demo. It's used to manage at user space to manage the audio, the microphone, and other audio-related devices. So this system service is responsible for setting the volume. And uh, fortunately, inside the sandbox profile, we also find the web process can directly talk with this system service. So thing, thing get easier. So we just send some message to this system service and ask this service to change the volume. So we can trigger the notification. OK, this is the, snap, the, the snapshot of the profile, sandbox profile. The last line here define what kind of message, oh, what kind of system service the web process can directly talk. So to challenge, challenge two, how can we leak the key ALSR slide? So how to make the leaked data meaningful? Recall that we can read 8-byte data and offset of uh, 38 in, in hex from a freight object in the KLOX uh, 72 zone. So what we did is we annually manually analyzed uh, a lot of objects in the same zone, I mean KLOX 72. And uh, from the many objects, we found a very interesting one called OI serialize. And uh, it's also in the same zone. And if you look at the member and offset 38 in hex, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called editor in the red box. The editor itself actually is a function pointer. So the def definition of the editor is in the end, is in the end of the slide. So basically, we can create a lot. So somehow we, we send some data to the kernel first and trigger the, the kernel to create a lot of OI serialized object. And then the kernel will, fin when the kernel finishes the job, he will free such OI serialized objects. And then we can apply the info leak bug, and we can get the uninitialized data back. And the uninitialized data happens to be the value of the ed editor field. So we get the function pointer value in the kernel. From that value, we can infer the whole layout of the memory catch, the kernel catch. So from here, we bypassed the kernel random, uh, address layout randomization. So let's go to the second one. It's a uninitialized stack variable. It will lead to actual code execution. And uh, the bug in the uh, EMD graphics driver, and I think the for different hardware models, Mac or MacBook, the, you may find different uh, graphic driver vendors like Intel or or AMD or, any, or some other vendors. And uh, I think the common implementation is called IO Accessorator Family 2. And different vendors they will inherit from this basic family and have their different implementations. And the vulnerability in the, is in the AMD random x something dot kit kernel extension. The x is a number. It may be different on different hardware model. Let's go ahead. OK. So the AMD accessorator can create different user clients. That's also the interesting part of this vulnerability. And that's, that's why a simple father does not work for to find this bug, although the bug is very simple. 
So two user clients are involved in this vulnerability. One is AMD SIGL context, and the one is a shared user client. So if you look at the IO surface open the API, and the third parameter is an integer type. So if you pass different type into the API, the, the kernel side will create a different type of user clients. And uh, those two types, uh, one is one and uh, one is six. So the context user client will not be started until you connect a shared user client. So basically, there is a very barely used user land API I will connect and uh, client. So almost, I mean, most, uh, I reviewed many kernel drivers. Maybe only L accelerator is the one using this API, re rely on this API. So if you write a very simple father and you don't know use this API, so you won't trigger the bug. And also, the context user client will support many external methods that allow the user land program to invoke. And the user land program can, can use the API IO connect call method. And the second parameter selector is used to tell the kernel object which function he wants to invoke. So most user client will use selector starting from zero, like zero, one, two, three. But the AMD drawer use selector 200, uh, starting from 200 in hex. So the bug happens in the selector 201 in hex. So if you pass selector 201, it will reach a function called something, blah, 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 surface copy. This function is supposed to look up a resource object according to uh, some input index that can, can be controlled by the user and the process to use the resource object. And the lookup process happens in the lookup resource function. And in the, in the decompiled code, you can see that the third parameter, V50 and V51, they are not initialized. They are on the stack. Basically, there are two pointers, but without initialization. The lookup resource function may fail if you input a invalid index, like a super large index. There, there's no such a resource, and the lookup resource will fail. So, but lookup resource internally won't initialize the two pointers. And the surface copy also doesn't check the return value from lookup resource. So if you simply supply invalid index, it, you will trigger a panic. So basically, the the two variable v50 and v51 will use the, some some value left on the stack as a pointer and use that value to to continue some virtual function call. So it will easily trigger a panic. So now the challenge is how can we make the initialized data meaningful? So how can we put some some data there and make the initialized value to use our our data. So I reviewed many kernel drivers. I happened to find a very interesting one called AGPM. It's maybe Apple Graphic Power Manager. And which servers a selector 7333? In this function, you will see that actually it will copy up to uh, 4K bytes user input to the kernel stack. So if you look at the decompiled code, I highlighted the string copy. Basically, the string copy, the source buffer is inside the, it's controlled by the kernel land. So it will copy almost, at most, uh, 4K bytes, non-zero data to the kernel stack. So what we can do is, we, oh, by the way, this driver can also be talked by web process. So we just invoke this function first, and we can taint the whole stack. And then we can trigger the, we can trigger the, the, the initialized uh, issue, and we can control the two stack variable. So now we have two choices. One is we mix, so what kind of data we want to use? We can make the pointer 
pointing to some fake object we put on the, on the hip. Or we can make the pointer pointing to some real object. And that, that will trigger some type of confusion. It's hard. So we, we prefer the first one. We make the pointer pointing to somewhere on the heap, and we can, we can occupy that address and put our data there. So remember the info leak bug. So basically, you can also use that, leverage that bug to leak some heap address. But we use a simple one. So we just do a brute force. Our process can spray a huge chunk of data, like several gigabytes data into the kernel. In that case, the heap randomization is very weak, because if you already allocated so much. And the user-controlled data will be lo located at a fixed address. So we, can, we achieve this by spray fake objects. We just use VM map copy. It's a, it's a typical heap spray technique on Mac OS and iOS. So it's very fast and has very small side effects on the heap. And we can basically control arbitrary size and the content. And the, the only weakness is that, so for example, we can, we can spray 4K page. And I mean, for each, for each element, we, the size is 4K. But at the beginning, uh, 18 bytes in hex, we cannot control because the, the kernel will put some metadata there. But it doesn't affect our exploit. So basically, we create a lot of page like this. It's 4K in size. And at the beginning, the first 20 in hex cannot be controlled. But the rest piece are also are all controlled by us. So we can make a fake virtual pointer there and pointing to the, the drop st stack. And after we trigger the uninitialized uh, stack variable, it will invoke some virtual function. And we can make the virtual function pointing to some gadget there. So in, the, in our drop chain, we first save all the registers and, uh, and change the stack. So on the latest version of Mac, or the, 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 I mean the MacBook, there are two very significant protection or exploit mitigations. One is called SMAP, S-M-E-P, and one is SMAP, S-M-A-P. They are used to protect the kernel from executing code in user land. And one is used to protect the, system, the kernel from accessing the data in the kernel. In the in the in the user lad, sorry, but we can disable the two protections by I, I will show you the drop guided. After we disable the two part mitigations, we can easily change the program counter to a user lad share code, so we don't have to drop anymore. We just jump into the sh the, the the code page in the in our own process, and then we can run the code in the, in the kernel. After we finish the, the whole exploitation, we can re-enable SMAP and SMAP, and the call thread exception return to, to, to return. So <coughs> SMAP and SMAP are implemented based on hardware. So there are a special register called CR4. The, the 21st and the 22nd bits of the register indicate the status of the CPU. I mean, whether it's SMAEP or SMAAP enabled or not. So basically, we can find two guides like this. So the first one is how to read the CR4. So basically, some if you find some guide, like, like it moves CR4 to REX and the return, OK, you find the guide. You can read the CR4. And then you can, you can change the CR4 value, and you, you can mutate the, the 21st and 22nd bits, and then you restore it. Then you can disable SMEP and SMAP. And the, <coughs> the interesting thing is the kernel stack used. So every time if you from the user led enter to enter the kernel, kernel mode, we believe that it will use the thread's own, thread's own kernel stack. 
But the truth is, on macOS, there is a common kernel stack. So every thread may use that stack. So if you want to tend the kernel stack, you may, you may need to tend it many times so that you can have higher chance to tend the both the kernel stack and also the thread stack. And there are some also log balance problem. But it's, it's also easy to do. OK. Let's go ahead to the third one, also the last one. It's a heap of flow issue. Actually, it's not a simple programming error to, to like, there's, there's no, no obvious programming error. It's caused by a fundamental issue in allocated data, sh data sharing mechanism. That means this fundamental issue results in many, many kernel bugs. The issue was reported by KingLab to Apple. They found some crash. Maybe they found that they, they believe it's not easy to exploit. But the truth is they burned a very good bug. So remember, IOConnect call method is used to send or receive data with the IO user client object. And this is this diagram indicated the whole Workflow. So basically, there are some user high-level user land API like IO connect uh, scanner method or struct method, and this, they are just some wrappers. Eventually, they will call a user land API called uh, this one, uh, IO connect method, and uh, the corresponding implementation in the kernel is this one, the, the the black box one. So let me explain such parameters. The first one is Connection, which means which user client you want to you, you want to send data to, and the second one is selector. We already see that, so the selector will tell the 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 drawer which method you want to call, and the third one, scalar input, it will store some integer values. It it can store up to sixteen uint sixty four integers, and the scalar input count indicate the, the number of the, the, the integers. And the, the in-band input is a buffer. The length is up to 4K. So if you want, only want to send a small chunk of data, then it, you can use the in-band input. You just embed the data in the message and send it to the kernel. But what would happen if you want to send a huge chunk of data to the kernel? So, Allocate supports the option called OL input, and also OL input size. So basically, you put the, the user land address there, and also the size there, and you pass it to the kernel. And the kernel, the kernel part will map, remap your data address into the kernel and make it read only in the kernel. OK, it's read only in the kernel, but it's writable in the user land. So there's no documentation for this fault. The, the bug is there for a long time, since the appearance of, since the first, uh, the f since the first beginning of Alcate. So you can see that it's implicated it shared memory. And apparently, it will cause many, many issues. And we will share one bug in IO Excel Excel display pipe user client 2, which also created by IO graphic accessory 2. And I think the type is 4. And uh, this user client supports many different external methods. And if you review these methods, and some of them will finally reach this function. It's called pipe post CSC gamma VID in it. And the code is very, very simple. So at the beginning, it will fetch an integer from the OL input and do a heap allocation through IO malloc. And later, it will refresh the size from the shared memory and use it in the memory copy. So now, I think it's, it's a perfect heap overflow. So basically, you can create two threads to reach the, the time window. So one thread, you just send the OL input to the pipe user client 
to the display, display pipe user client so that the, the kernel will allocate something and copy something to the, to the allocated buffer. And in a, in a different thread, like thread two, which runs in parallel, you can modify the size field. So if you can win the time window between the allocation and the memory copy, you can change the size field to arbitrary value. So if you change the size smaller than the original value, you can make you can transfer it into a info leak because the malloc buffer is not initialized and it is supposed to copy the same length of data from user land to the heap buffer. But if you change the size smaller than the original value, it will make the allocated buffer only initialized very at the very beginning. So the rest piece is not initialized. So you can get an info leak. If you can change the size larger than the original value, your data will overwrite the, the next, next object. So now what we can control. So basically you can control the destination buffer size because the allocation is, is uh, I think the allocation uses the size supplied by the user land. So basically that means you can prepare, you can use heap spring technique to make some holes in the, in the zone you want. So the it will make the destination buffer will be allocated in some of the hole and the next objects will be controlled by you. And also you can control the size, the source buffer size. Through the risk condition, you can change the size to any value. So basically you can control how much you want to overwrite. And also the source buffer content, the data. So basically you can copy user controlled data to the next object. So it's very easy to overwrite the virtual table, right? After that, you trigger the next, you invoke the virtual function of the next object, you can just use the exploitation techniques we, we showed in the initial, the second vulnerability. So basically you can jump to somewhere and you gain the whole code execution in the kernel. Okay, so for the first two vulnerabilities, they were fixed in 10.12.3, January 23rd this year. And uh, there are two CV numbers. We used the two vulnerabilities in Pongfest uh, last year. And the third one, actually there's no, as far as I knew, so there's no public CVE. And uh, Apple finally f realized that maybe it's not possible to change the driver one by one. So how Apple fixed the problem is it changed the OL shared memory as copy on write. So if, you, if the user land change the, change the, 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 the data, it, it will be different copies. So the kernel has a, has a copy and the user land has a different copy. So it won't, it, it fundamentally fixed the issue. So now I'm going to conclude the talk. So as we see the, these vulnerabilities, so finding them is not easy because the only limited number of IOK drawers can be opened by web process. And these drawers are reviewed by many parties, Apple, or different security researchers, and a lot of bugs are already fixed. So finding new bugs is not easy, but it's, the whole process is fun. And you will see some, a lot of undocumented features in the kernel, and you'll find a new attack service. The whole process is very exciting. And directly exporting Windows kernel, uh, I mean Mac OS kernel inside Safari Sandbox is hard, but as we proved, it's feasible. And uh, we believe that in future, it will continue to be feasible because we will continue to find new bugs and uh, people will continue to make mistakes. I mean, Apple programmers. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm glad to answer your question. Thank you. Yes, yes. So basically, I think only a few drivers you have the source code. 
for the most uh, third-party vendor drivers, there's no source code. We have to do binary analysis. It's my daily job. <laughs> so as I discussed, in, so at the beginning, we, we tried to run our father. And, but we realized that the low-hand fruit already taken. So for example, for the, for the second one, if you have to call some barely used API, I will connect and client, and you have to specify very rare selector. If you don't reverse engineer the binary, you won't notice that. So that means we have to do reverse engineer first. And at the time you reverse engineer the binary, you already notice the bug. So we, we don't have to use further. So basically now we have to do the manual inspection. Thank you.